Welcome to another Focus on Liberia Marketplace. I'm going to be your host, William King, and you're being joined this time with a full deck of Focus on Liberia folks. We have Dennis Ja, Anson is here, and we have our special guest, Gabriel Tagbito Carter. And so today we're going to be talking about venture capitalists, or in so many words, uh, all of this private money, are they investing in companies in Africa and so forth. So once again, thank you for joining Focus on Liberia. If you look on our screen, we have our phone number and the uh, code for later on, we'll be taking calls. Also, please feel free to drop off some comments uh, as you're watching the show with any questions or thoughts, and we're going to be sharing that as well. And right now, I will pass this back to uh, to uh, Dennis Shaw to say something, and then Anthony, and then Gabriel, and then I'll come back with our disclaimer, and we'll get it started. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, William. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Focus on Liberia. And uh, Anthony is now with us today. He's in, the back, he's in the back office doing all the technical stuff to bring us this beautiful program. Again, this is our Focus on Liberia Marketplace, where we talk business, economics, and finance. Our guest, that's the man, Gabriel Tabito Carter. We are glad to have you, Gabriel. Welcome to Focus on Liberia. I want to welcome all our viewers from across the globe. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, William. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you guys again. Uh, I think this is my second time on the show. So it's a pleasure every time to get, to come on the show and, you know, dispose whatever knowledge, you know, I have. Um, you know, as I say, I like to be, I want this to be an interactive conversation. So I hope it can be as, you know, interactive as possible. And as much as I'm willing to, you know, as the knowledge, I'm looking to learn from you guys and your audience as well. So thank you for having me. Most definitely, most definitely. As I said, you know, before the show started uh, behind the scene, I said, we didn't learn about money in Liberia when I was growing up. If you are a guy and you love to talk about money, the people keep an eye on you say you're going to become a role because you're talking <laughs> money. If you are a girl and you like to talk about money, they say you're going to be grown as we said, those days. So money was not taught. And that's why, you know, sometimes we, we do things, we put all in all the hard work, but we are not really taught or we don't know how to make money. And so we keep it as a taboo. And then when we went to church and they said the love of money is the root of all evil, some of us understood it has the love of money as money being the root. So yep. money, we, 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 we don't... So when you say Gabriel Carter and money and investment on the writing, that's the place I want to be. Back to you, Whip, or... William, for our disclaimer. You, you are muted, William. Thank you. That is such a pleasure. And I know we have a lot to cover. So we're going to get right into this thing after I read our disclaimer right now. Oh, if the content is for informational purpose only, you should not construe any such information or other material as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. Nothing contained on our media or written documents constitute a solicitation, recommendation, endorsement, or offer by Focus on Liberia or any third party service provider to buy or sell any securities or other financial instruments in this or in any other jurisdiction in which such media material may be shared. All content on this site is information of general nature and does not address the circumstances of any particular individual entity. Nothing in the media constitute professional and financial advice, nor does any information on the platform constitute a comprehensive or complete statement of the matters discussed or the laws relating thereto. So ladies and gentlemen, just in, in uh, real simple, what we're saying is that if you're going to make a financial decision, please consult your financial advisor. Uh, please uh, uh, use those. Focus on Liberia is in no way uh, qualified to provide you financial advice. With that being said, we're going to jump right into it. So, Gabriel, uh, share a little bit about yourself, your uh, background, and viewers are always interested to know, you know, when we have Liberians, where do you heal from? Um, I, I, well, obviously, I'm a Liberian. Um, currently, I work in, in banking as a commercial underwriter portfolio manager. Uh, I think the last time I was on the show, I told you guys uh I manage a portfolio of about 200 million. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I underwrite close to that a year in a year. So, and that consists about, you know, small businesses to, you know, companies about 20 million size. Um, I have about, I'd say almost close to a hundred companies in my portfolio. Uh, so that's currently what I do. I do I do that for Midside Bank, uh, Eastern Bank in, Ma- in Massachusetts. We're about 13 billion uh, in asset owner management. Um, and I've been doing that for the last three years. Uh, before that, I was at uh, Bank of America as an analyst. And before Bank of America, I was with uh, Citizen Bank, um, working with small businesses, pretty much on the front line, working with small businesses. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's practically my background. Um, for education, I, I have a master's from uh, Brandeis University International Business School here in, in Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, that's pretty much about me. And I you guys know where I live. I don't think I need to tell anybody where I live. So, <laughs> so, so Gilbert, right. you, you used two. Again, I said we don't learn about money. You right. said you want to write. I don't know what it. So explain what that means. And then the money you talk about, two hundred million. Do you touch it? What What is that? What you do with it? In so, terms? so uh, the first question is underwriting. So underwriting, what it means is that for businesses. Um, that come to the bank to apply for a loan, whether you want to uh, you know, take Focus of Africa to launch it in five other countries and say, hey, guys, I need a, uh, let's say, $5 million, right? That request comes to me, comes to my department. We're on the commercial side. So we cover both the small business and the commercial side. So that request comes to me. I have to look into your background. We have, we do what we call due diligence. I have to look at the basic things, such as your credit score, uh, how much money you've been making for the last three or two years. Are you profitable? Um, what do we take? What are you giving us for collateral? Um, so we look into all of those basic nuances to determine whether we should give you that five millions or not. Right um, now, as far the second question, whether we do touch the money? No, we do not. This is. <laughs> If 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 I do decide that okay, this guy is he sh- we should give him the money based on everything that we've looked into, um, that money goes to your, you know, it get wired to your account, right? Mm-hmm. If it's a line of credit, it get wired to your whether uh, deposit account, or if you're making a, a big purchase, that money get you know paid directly to whoever you're making that purchase to. So in yeah. some cases, in most time, at all we don't we don't touch it. You know. Right. Okay. Right. Because I work in a place in the um, Zarikuli refugee camp where they say anytime you play with oil, oil will live on your finger. That's a justification <laughs> to steal the money. Back to you, William. I'll be jumping in because I want this very basic so I can understand. Oh, right. That, that definitely. And I think me too as uh, well. And I and I think, you know, we'll start uh, definitely here. Yeah. Gerbo, so tell us, uh, you know, venture capital, you know, what is what does that um, uh, mean? Venture capital, venture capital. So, so venture capital is basically a private individual looking to invest in, make investment, whether in company or in other people that are looking to start businesses, right? That's venture capital. So if you have, let's say, 5 million or 10 million or 20 million, that you're just sitting there in your, your account, you say, you know what, I need to find some way to make this money work for me. You can take that money and give it to a private equity firm. Say, guys, I have 10 million here that I want to invest. Uh, you know, based on what the company is investing in, you can say they will tell you we can invest that 10 million for you for either you know a 5% return or 10% return. So for you, we will call you the venture capitalist because you're not directly uh investing that money yourself. We call you a venture capitalist. Now the companies that do the investment. Right, the company that would take the money and say, "Hey, we're going to charge you a management fee uh, to invest that money." Those are the one we call private equity firms. So that's, in a nutshell, that's pretty much what it is. So private equity, uh, you said private equity. So is that uh, meaning this is your own money, or you you go into people as telling them that you think you have a way that you can better make them more money? And so you got you you absolutely got that right. So you 
if I, I can start a private equity firm and I, I know you're a wealthy individual uh-huh. <laughs> or and go to um, Dennis and I know that Dennis is a wealthy individual. So I propose to him, I said, guys, I am, I did start a company. You know, we have a company that is investing, let's say in a consumer space, right? So every company that we invest in is specifically, specifically in a consumer space industry, right? And I will go to you guys, petition you guys and say, this, this is a fund that I'm starting to do that. Um, I'm looking to raise, let's say, 100 million. You know, if you have, let's say, about 5 million or 10 million sitting aside, you can give me that money and say, I trust what you're going to do with that money. You know, invest it however way you see fit. So on my end, I will be what we call a general partner, right? A general partner, a limited partner, right? Because my rights to that money is limited. All I do is give it to you. You do whatever you want to do with it. At the end of the day, you bring me my return. So that's basically what private equity is. So they've solicited funds from wealthy individual or even wealthy company or even sovereign wealth funds. They will even go to sovereign wealth funds and you know solicited investments to invest in companies. In some cases, they will grow that company and sell it. Or in some cases on a bigger scale, like you know, the Bain Capital, the KKR, or the Carlyle Group, they will grow that company and then you know take it public. So you take the company public. You make a lot of money. That way, you, you return those money to so, investment to whoever you know you okay. collected those funds from. Now you just mentioned taking a company public. So I guess uh, tell us the difference with these guys when they first start investing the uh, money. Um, can anyone in the world invest, or is it it's not public yet? So they 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 targeting a few individuals. So there's there's a a term called creditor investors, right? Okay. So there's there's two there's two forms. So creditor investor, because people, everybody think they know how to invest, right? I don't want the, your little retirement money you save aside because I'm I came out to you and say, hey, I'm investing uh, in these industries. You can get excited and say, hey, here's my retirement money. Go make me money. There's a risk associated with that. You can give me a money. I could lose that money, right? So we have what they call accredited investors. Credit investors meaning that you have to have a certain level of liquidity. So in most cases, it starts at 250000 in cash. Like in cash, I'm not just talking about your network, right? Just cash, liquidity available to, to invest. Whoa, That's the minimum. You can't even, so that means, hold on, meaning you will not even talk to me if if I'm not sitting on, if on, you, on a small if chunk you are of not. If you are not sitting on that level of money, you can't. You we cannot consider you uh, accredited investors, right? That's on the basic end. On the higher end, like the the uh, the hedge funds, right? The hedge fund that's even more riskier, right? You have to have at least uh, one million dollar in liquid assets available in order to even participate in hedge funds. So now that's still the rule. However. I think it was in 2008, they created the uh, the Job Act, right? Which actually saw the spur, the you know, uprising of um, what you call these small investment companies. Um, so that allowed people like you and I to invest. Let's say you can even, there are some companies that start, that invest in local community um, companies that are starting up. You can even invest as little as $100, $200, five dollars 5000 up to that work. Right. In that case, you don't have to be an accredited investor, but most private equity firm or venture capital firm or even hedge funds, you have to have that much liquidity available in order to do that. OK, wow. This is this is something you're talking about uh, that. I mean, for somebody, it may be a little bit of a high risk, right, because you're saying that it's like. Maybe you go to a few people or to a group of folks and say, hey. I got this idea. I think it can make us money. Um, do you want to put some money in it? But uh, in terms of a lot of regulations around you as a person, right? It really, is it depends if like people know you, right? Because it's different than the public. Because mm-hmm. when you go to public a uh, public company, the government says you have to have such and such accountants. Right, all these folks, right? But here is just saying that hey, we're gonna take you for face value, huh? Right, right, right. 
Okay, wow. Okay. So my question there is, uh, Gabriel, so what, what do I look at before I invest in this private equity? So, so before there's companies that will actually come to you and say, hey, what they're trying to raise from, from you, they will give you what's called a prospectus, right? So they will give you the entire scope of what their focus is, right? So okay. most companies, if you go on some private equity website, they will say, we're investing in a consumer space. We're looking at technology. We're looking at real estate, right? So they will give that to you for you to look at it. And they will tell you their, uh, you know, investments, right? They will tell you the investment. They will tell you how much you can expect to, to make on that investment that you're going to give them. Now, absolutely nothing is certain. Nothing is ever certain in this world we live in, right? There's always risk, especially in those industry where there's less regulations, you are bound to be at a higher risk. That's why those people that invest in those industry, they got to make sure that you have that level of liquidity. So that way, when you lose that money, you're not back on your knees, starting from square one, right? So those are the type of things you look at, right? Mm -hmm. Now, as Will pointed out, you have to know these people, right? It can't just be any company coming out to you and say, you know, I want to, you know, raise money from you, you go into that and say, hey, I'm going to give you that money. You have to know the individual. You have to know their character. Just how if you're building a relationship with somebody, you take your time to do it. It's the same approach you take to do that. And you have to want, the most important thing you want to look at is their track record. How many companies have they built up? Have they taken public right. or have they turned around? Have they sold? What's their return rate? Uh, what's their failure rate? All those things you want to ask for. If you're coming, if I'm coming to you to say, hey, I'm you know, I'm trying to raise five million from you to to start this company. The first thing you ask for, hey, have you done this before? Right? Have you done this before? How much money have you made before? What's your return? What's your failure rate? How many companies have you taken and how much right. have failed? Because most of these companies do fail in that industry. You know, so those are basic things you want to look for. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So so now these are venture capitalists, they look right. for these startup companies to invest in. Mm -hmm. I have one of those companies. Why nobody's coming to me? So, so my question there: What will a venture capitalist look for before investing in these uh, startup companies? So, is so this is just somebody's on somebody's on the phone. Very good. I fixed it. I fixed okay. it. Okay. Okay. So it's it's just like how do you call it? Uh, you have to sell yourself. Right. Um, so let's say you have focus on Africa. You want to take it to, you know, uh, yeah, three, level. Three, exactly. You want to take it to a different level. Right. Yeah. You have to put a, what, we, what we call a pitch deck together. Right. We call it a pitch deck because if I am the investor, you can't present to me. Let's say you know me privately. You said, Gabriel, you give me a phone call. I said, Gabriel, I'm running this company. This is my idea. I want to, you know, I want to grow this company. Um, would you mind, you know, taking a look at it? And if it's if something that's interested to you, would you mind investing in it? I say, you know what? Do you have a pitch deck? Do you have, can you, would you mind sharing it with me? I was, and you might say, yes, you know, we can set up a meeting, whether in a, a conference room somewhere, and I, I ask you to present that to me. So you have a presentation, you go over it with me. You start from square one, what you're going to, how you founded the company, the history and everything. You go to the revenue model, how you're going to make money. Um, how you're going to grow that company from where it is to whatever you want to take it. And it's up to me to glean that information that you give me to ask you question, like investment question. Hey, uh, have you talked? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? Right. So you have to put yourself out there. You have a, put a business plan together, put a pitch deck together, start making phone call. It's just, as you said, you're you're the CEO of this uh, platform. So you have to be the salesperson. You have to wear the sales hat. You put your hat on. You have the business plan. You make phone calls. I know sometimes you might even get rejected. Some people say, my man, I'm not interested. That's fine. Go to the next person, you know. But that's what you have to do. You can't, sure. you know, or somebody might refer them to you if you stop putting the words out. Say, this guy is looking to grow his company to the next level. Uh, you might want to give him a call. That might be something you might be interested in. Because I look around the La Labyrinth La diaspora community and I see all these NGOs. And it looks like nobody's trying to make money. Thank you. <laughs> and that's another topic for another day. <laughs> yeah. That's another topic for another day. Right. But go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, that, that's so so you so that's why I, first of all, I think that this is important that we talk about it. 
right. because uh, maybe we're not putting, we're not making that pitch there. No, the NGO, you know, just for a quick tangent here, the NGO, you're right, there's a whole lot of them, right? And NGO, nonprofit, you're not trying to make money. Um, people get squeamish when you talk about, you know, NGO and nonprofit, right? There's a thing called in the, in the NGO, what we call it, uh, donuts fatigue, right? Yeah. If you're raising funds all the time, I'm coming to you and giving you money all the time. I want to see you turn, make something out of that money that I'm giving you all the time. Every year when you do your fundraiser, every money that I'm giving you, I want to see you put that money into something sustainable. So that way you're not continuing to come to me to keep asking for money. You know, I think that's why um, most people get, most uh, donors to NGO get tired of giving those people money. But there's a whole lot of them. They're not, you know, yeah. um, right. So, so on that note, let's turn our attention to Africa and talk about venture capitalists in Africa. Perfect. Perfect. There right. is the guy opening his book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I just I, I have some notes. I think that was the yeah, focus. Let, let's let's do that because uh right. And pick any country you want to start from, but let's discuss venture capitalism in Africa and see whether it's there, the companies are there, people are doing these things. So venture capitals as a whole in Africa or private equity, um it is actually what we call on a growth spread right now, right? So from 2000 to 2006, right? It it grew about, I'll say 4.6% 4. every year, right? Okay. So it's on a, it's on a, on a, on a, what we call a growth spread right now. So the reason that is actually happening, that's because, you know, back in the 2000, we saw basically what we see now, we heard what we see, what we heard now that, what we're hearing now that, Africa is the next frontier market. They're becoming mm -hmm. the next China, right? And that, we heard that conversation back in 2000. And the reason why that didn't happen because most of that projection was being done was based on commodity prices. So when the commodity prices on the world market tanked, that whole momentum shifted with it, right? But right now we're seeing that momentum building back up. So most investors are looking to Africa to invest in it, right? So there's a lot of money pouring into Africa right now. Um, and there are a lot of companies uh, specifically from the U.S., about you know 40% of the, the private equity that goes into Africa, the investors come right here from the U.S. So you are in luck if you want to take focus on Africa to another level. Your, your best chance of getting the money is right here in the U.S., um, so there's, there's a lot of activity going on on, on the continent. Um, and, and I think what we're seeing is, is, is in, in some isolated cases that are some countries that are there that aren't seeing the activity that's happening. But in most cases, like the East Africa, West Africa, uh, South Africa, the only country that is, you know, what I call a region that is not experiencing a lot of activity is the, uh, the Central Africa region right now. Now, do you have a, so, uh, go ahead. So me. this is in Sierra Leone, Liberia, Guinea, Africa's. I think <laughs> 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 there's, I know there's a reason why you asked that question. Um, to be honest with you, no. So when I mean West Africa, we're looking at the Africa's, um, Ghana, uh, Nigeria, uh, Senegal. Um, yeah, those countries, those countries are attracting a lot of private equity investment or venture capitalists to invest in it. But Liberia, I don't even want to get started on that end right now. Uh, Sierra Leone, not much. Uh, Guinea, not much. Um, I think Nigeria, Ghana, uh, the Ivory Coast, the most are the ones that are getting the investment on the West African side of things. And some part of it, uh, what do you call it, Senegal. So what those companies would look for if they want to go into spaces like Liberia or... So it is it I think most of it has to do with your stability. Um mm -hmm. invest your stability, investability. Um there's uh yeah, I think most most importantly, those two, there's opportunity. So people that are investing right now in what are the frontier market in Africa or emerging markets, there's a reason why they're going there. Usually they do when there's downturn in the West market here. So they're looking for other places to put their money. Right now, in those regions, there might be high risk, but they know it with, with those risks, there's high probability of them getting a return. Now, yeah. for Liberia and 
you know, Guinea or Sierra Leone, countries like that, that I don't, I don't want to say there isn't a lot of opportunity. There are a lot of opportunity, but it, it's kind of hard to really, uh, you know, get a, a hold of the, uh, the uh, political stability in, in, in those regions, right? Mm -hmm. So not only the political stability, the, you know, if I invest my money, what industry that are there, you know, the electric, the stability of the electric. So case in point here, I'm talking to a group of, you know, investors right now that are looking to do specifically manufacturing in Liberia, right? They want to manufacture certain things in Liberia. However, when I met with this guy, he's the German guy. The first, before I met with this guy, he had a list of things. I mean, disadvantages of why that investment in our country in Liberia wouldn't make sense. So the first 30 minutes of that conversation, I was sitting there trying to diffuse, not diffuse it, but actually talk him, give him the actual uh, reality of, of the country to him, right? So sometimes it's actually an image problem too that actually limits some of the people from going into those country. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gabriel, for, for just a real quick, I know maybe your phone or your device shakes a little bit, but uh, just want to give you a heads up, but- uh, Right, quick. right. Okay. You're muted. Oh, Dennis, I'm muted. Oh, I'm good. No, go ahead. Okay, okay, good. So um, you mentioned something important uh, that you feel that there's a need to try to, it's kind of a little bit more of a hard work to get that money out there, right? Um, right. In the countries that are maybe having some some good luck in that space, mm -hmm. let's look at maybe Senegal, Ivory Coast, or Nigeria, maybe. Right. Where are the money going? Where is it flowing into? Is it flowing into agriculture, real estate, or is it in... Uh, you know, technology, I mean, share share with us. Where is the money going right now? So for for those regions, most of the money is actually, actually, let me open my notes here. Most of the money is actually going into the financial, what do you call it, the financial sector, right? Uh, the consumer space as well. Um, we have, yeah, the, so consumer discretionary, right? So 18% of the investment is going into that. Uh, the same thing with information technology. We have right we have give me something that when you say consumer space so uh, consumer maybe, uh, an example of maybe a product that maybe we, we, we might so consumer it could be let's say toilet paper or toilet tissue okay. or it could be uh you know two page right so those are consumer discretionary uh space right mm -hmm. so 18 percent of the investment is going into that however even though 18 percent of that investment is going in that industry because it's a consumer uh, discretionary space, the return on that space is higher at 28%. So if you were to invest 18% in that consumer space, you're returning 18% on your investment in that industry. The second one is the uh, information technology. So there's a lot of information technology investment going on. However, the return on that is not as is not as broad, it's not as you know lucrative as the uh, the consumer space. Uh, also, the other one is financial uh, sector. The financial sector, the same thing. There's about 19% of the investment that is going into private equity goes into the financial sector. Now, the returns on that is higher. If So if you were a private equity firm going into that, you saw this report, you would say, hey, you know what? I'm better off going into the financial sector because I know my return will be higher than any sector on that, um, you know, that are currently you know, taking investment right now. Uh, so there's there's a very diverse, the healthcare, even though I think healthcare is one of the most important thing uh, sector that we should be investing in, there's only 7% that's going into that sector. And the return on that is dismal. Maybe that's why most uh, private equity or venture capital, capitalists aren't investing in that, right? So there's always, you know, you have to do your due diligence to find out what's the best place to put your money to get the best return. When you're talking about uh, some of these um, industries that a venture capital looks at, right? Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned health. Right. Companies, um, you mentioned the banking sector. Now, I have noticed a big increase in money transfer tools, money mm -hmm. transfer 
options to now send money to um, Africa. And in addition to that, I have seen quite a bit of IT companies looking to create these databases for patients, mm -hmm. for patient information in places like, like Nigeria, Senegal, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, but to your point, what is the difference between that? Isn't that the health sector or is that just a service that, that's provided to the health sector? It's it's part, it's kind of a, what's called a dual. Um, so let's say if you have an IT company that's collecting data for the healthcare, most, I would say it will most likely be considered a technology company than a healthcare company. Um, depending on how, I mean, again, the classification can go either way, right? Um, so I, I don't really think that the classification matters. I, I think the, uh, because depending on who's, who the CEO is, they can classify as a tech company or they can classify as a healthcare company that is doing, uh, okay. uh, you know, that, you know, collects data on, on, on people. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Kato. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are just joining us, this is, Focus on Liberal Marketplace. We are discussing venture capitalists in Africa. Our guest is Mr. Gabriel Tabito Carter. Uh, and uh, we want our guests or our audience to join us. If you're interested in the uh, discussion and want to be a part, uh, the phone line is posted with the uh, with the code. Please call us and uh, engage with us. We want this to be interactive. So Mr. Carter, before the uh, show, because I, I was looking up some uh, venture capitalists in, in Africa. So give us some examples and specifically what are they investing in and where? All right, so some of the companies, I think the, the most notable ones that are you know in this space right now in Africa, um, as I said earlier, I think 40% of them, 40% of them come from the US. 8% uh, uh, of them actually from 4% in Nigeria, South South Africa is nine percent. UK is eight percent. Um, so the Netherlands, United uh, Arab Emirates, France, all of them actually have about three percent. China, Egypt, and Canada about I would say two percent. Now the companies that are actually investing in the in the space in uh, in Africa, we look at you know T T L Com Capital, right? Uh, there's Afrique Invest, there's Colwell Investment, there's Alethea Capital. And one of my favorite is Mediterranean Capital Partners. They're based in uh, in the north north part of Africa, but they they you know they have investment in in west, in the east, and I think they're expanding a little bit in South Africa as well. Uh, so, I mean, there's a whole lot, a whole lot of them. There are a lot of them that are emerging right now because I think what's happening, even though as I said earlier, so 40% of the investment that happen in Africa in the private equity space come from the USA. What is happening, whether we want to believe it or not, they're investing in people of their kind. So if you're, let's just pull it bluntly. If you're a white guy from here, you go into Africa to start a company, your chances of getting capital for somebody to invest in you is higher than somebody who's actually on the ground trying to launch a company down there, right? So that's exactly, even though we see this investment going in there, they are not specifically being invested uh, in Africans um, that are starting company on the continent as well. So that's the disparity that is one of the biggest disparity that is happening on the continent right now. So this is why you're seeing, you know, some countries like South Africa, uh, you know, and countries in, the, in West Africa, they're, they're, they're starting their venture capital firm to actually invest in those entrepreneurs that are starting companies in those countries. Well, you bring up something that's, that's kind of a little bit um, alarming, right? And a little bit disconcerting to be right. quite honest with you, right? I mean, um, why is that? Why Why is it that? Because I, I'm guessing it's the idea or or is it that the there's a certain structure here on the uh, Western side that that we in Africa don't have? Well, two. There's two. It's twofold. Okay. It's actually it's actually twofold. This first being that, um, you know, the, uh, the we don't have the structure. What we call the structure there. So recently, 
there are companies right now that are passing, you know, uh, laws, that, you know, surrounding private equity, right? So how to how to regulate that industry, right? But in most part, most country on the continent, they don't have laws and regulation to 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 regulate that industry. So if I'm an investor coming from here trying to invest in that industry, I will be a little squirmish about the whole, you know, the fact that you don't have regulation there because if my capital goes south, I need to make sure that there are rules and regulation that governs that, right? Now, that's one. The second part about it is that, again, it's a confidence thing, right? The most, com- believe it or not, most people are investors from here and private equity companies from here. They don't think that, you know, the African entrepreneur has the well, you know, the strength or the, the know how to be able to take a company from, you know, ground up and grow it into whatever, you know, scalability they want it to be in order for them to make their returns, you know. So they're more likely to go with people that they know that are, you know, maybe have some track record from here that are now going into that space to do it or, they, you know, they're not going to invest at all. Like case in point, the guy who started the uh, that biking thing in a company in Nigeria who just got killed in New York, right? There's a Pakistani, right? There's a Pakistani guy, leave from here, from right in in New York, went and started a, a bike hailing company, just like Uber, but on a bike level in Nigeria, right? This is somebody, he raised 5 million from here, right? Now, do you think, come on, there's 190 million people in Nigeria. You don't think somebody thought about that idea? Why do you think they didn't, they weren't able to get money? Again, it's, it's part of the, uh, you know, the confident level, me having confidence in you as an investor and having that trust that you are able to able, able to grow that company to whatever level I want you to grow it to, to be able to make my returns. Right. So, Mr. Carter, what would it take Africans now, like us, to say, okay, this is, uh, let's invest in this one. We don't have that much money. William has been trying to get people together to raise money. I know it does. I think he's on a. It's, I think he's on a good path there. Um, and I don't want to get too, you know, downside here. But I think that's something a mindset that we're embracing now as African, right? We're understanding that nobody is going to invest in Africa, right? So you can't just sit there and say, "Hey, I'm building this company. I'm going to seek investment in the West or whatever to 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 fund it," right? You, you we're building company, but at the same time, we're looking at inwardly for investment on the ground. There are, as I said, there are a lot of companies that are sprouting up right now, investment uh, companies that are sprouting up to invest in companies uh, that are emerging in the, uh, you know, in the space in, in, in Africa right now. Oh, we, we may not have that big money that is required, or can there be done something on, on a smaller scale? You know, maybe like hundred thousand, or is it just too small? Right. So there are companies. I think one. I don't know if I mentioned it. There's Bamboo Capital. There's Bamboo Capital. There's another one called Knife Capital. Uh, most, I think, two of these are re- located in Ghana. There's uh, there's Another one that is actually has a dual purpose is the raise from from the private side and the raise from from the public side. It's called um, uh, grassroots business fund, right? Grassroots business fund, right? Those people start as little as five thousand, ten thousand, up to mm-hmm. the to you know ten million, thirty million, thirty uh, forty million, right? So there are companies that are realizing that. You can't just focus people on the higher end of the spectrum anymore. You have to look at people from the lower end of the spectrum in order to be able to build that, um, you know, to 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 build companies from the ground up. So you, there, there are companies that are proud enough to to do that right now, as we speak. Yeah, the, um, you know, something to um, touch on mm-hmm. uh, the source for a, a venture capitalist, the source of funding. So let's talk about a little bit now. You mentioned something important about the Jobs Act. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we didn't get into some of the tools available uh, through which one may just be sitting at the desk. Um, They got a pop-up or something and say, you know what, this is good. I'm into tequila. I'm into wine. I'm into palm wine. Right. And uh, this guy say he wants to do a, a, a palm wine company. Brewer. Right. And, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's asking me to just put in 100 bucks. 
mm-hmm. or 200 bucks at a time. In the U.S., what makes that easy versus uh, basically in Africa, like some of these crowdfunding? Exactly. And I think that's one thing you mentioned. So at one point, there was an emergence of crowdfunding site, right? But, you know, there are some that are looking at the African continent as a whole, right? And then there are some that are looking at country specific, right? But in most countries, you don't have those platforms, right? So let's say for any entrepreneurs, and let's say like that Liberia for case, let's say any enterprise in Liberia who is launching a company, so they start that company, even for the idea standpoint, they, they don't have a platform to go on to say, this is what I'm doing. And we don't have that platform to, to connect the entrepreneur with the investor to say, you can go on this place, you put your idea on there, the investor is going to look at, go through there and browse those idea. And if they like that idea, they can go there and reach out to you directly to see where you guys can go from there. We don't have those platforms. Uh, we do in certain isolated cases, as I said, but in most countries, you don't. There are some in Nigeria, in some countries in the West, um, but we don't, uh, in, in on West Africa, but you know, those are isolated. For most part of Africa, you don't have those platforms there to give people those assets to, to investors. Okay, well, if I if I want to play devil's advocate, can I say that um that this venture capitalist idea comes from from us from the continent because um we at the at at the grassroots level, right? The person has they say, hey, I want to have my own little market stall. They go to mm-hmm. that aunt, they go to that cousin and they say, okay, it's gonna cost me maybe 700 bucks for me to launch my little stall in uh on a, a water side. Right. But now what you're saying is that that concept of that idea, because right. technology, it kind of allows uh, that to be scalable. Right. So I don't, I don't even know how to respond to that question. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, well, I mean, cause it's still in the venture capitalist space, right? You, you're talking about on one end, you like okay, you need to get money, right? You, 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 I mean, then you're going out there, but who who better is going to invest in the on their continent? I, I mean, to, for the, the uh, scenario you actually give, I think, I mean, you can say that you 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 you're able to make the argument that you know it, it started from there, but at the same point, right? You have to have a level of credibility, right? If I know you. That you you know you came up to me and say you know I'm starting this venture or whatever it is, right? I'm able to give you the money if I have it, if I know your background, if I know what you're doing, if I trust in what you're doing, and, and know that this guy is able to do what he said he's going to do without you know going off with the money. And if he does, I know the the, the system in place, there's regulation in place to allow me to go after him. Now. For most part, as I said, we don't have that structure um, in place to to facilitate those kind of investments. And I think some part of it, that's what hurts us in the, on the grand scheme of things to to really be able to take this thing off the ground. And but right. Go ahead. Well, remember, you wanted this thing to be interactive. We have a caller. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to go to the uh, caller lines um, right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, one second, please. Right. I'll ask the call to, to uh, unmute themselves. So uh, so before we bring in the callers, let me uh, read a few comments here. So the caller. Uh, uh, William, you have to unmute the, uh, the, the call line. OK. Let me let, let me take care of that right now. I'm clicking the so, ask. So, so I have a uh, from from Philip Fokba. Do you think investing in agribusiness in Liberia is a good idea? Then from Eugenio, how can one invest? Those are the two comments on Facebook. Okay, so let me answer the one about agribusiness in agribusiness in Liberia. Now. I, the, the, the agriculture sector in Liberia, I think, is probably the one of the most underrated sector in uh, not just in, in the country, right? 
And if you look at the content as a whole, agriculture is really underrated. I, I think there's a lot of value to be created in that sector that we're not leveraging. Um, but to boil it down to the to the question, how you know whether is a, is a good idea, it depends what what type of area you want to go into. Are you looking at you know producing, let's say, fruit and then drying the fruits and selling it, or are you looking to uh, you know you know such as tomato paste, creating tomato paste, you know what you know a lot of raw material go to waste. You know people produce tomato, you don't want it to go to waste. You can have a cooperative of farmers to you know, harvest the tomato, bring it to you. You have the processing plant. You process it. You put it in a can and, and resell it. Um, there's, I, I think, there's a lot of opportunity in that place. But I think if you were to go in, you will have to create the value chain from the ground up, right? So you will have to, you know, create maybe your own cooperative of farmers or talk to farmers to to plant the products for you, the tomatoes or whatever sector you're going. I mean, um, field or agriculture you're going into, you have to depending on what, what it is, you have to create like a factory to, to process it, right? Because you can't just say, I'm going to produce whatever you're going to produce and sell it to the market. Everybody's doing that. And if that is not working. Food go to waste all the time. So you have to create a value chain from the ground up. If you are able to create a value chain from the ground up, you are. You, I think you that, that's a very um, lucrative sector to go into. Okay, good. Now let's, let's talk about this uh, venture capitalist right there on the um, in these countries and and the the, the local economy, mm -hmm. what, what has been what has the impact been from 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 what you see? So venture capital is the private equity sector is very is massive um, because again it's broad. You can say any company that is not on the public publicly traded uh, market is a you know private private equity company, right? Which is true. Um, that is about $3.9 trillion uh, market value, right? It grows at a rate about 12.2% every year. That is insane, right? That is saying 3.9 trillion dollar grows at 12% every year. That's, that's, that's one of the reasons why the US is one of the, the best, you know, economy in the world because people are innovative, people are starting company. Right, and these people that are starting company, there's there's money, there's money everywhere in the United States. I know people say it loosely, but there's money out there. People are sitting on money that they want to invest in. You just have to find the right place to go to, um, you know, to be able to raise the money. So there's money out there's there's money out there. So that's what's contributing to the the U.S. the U.S. Uh, one of the the reason why the country is dominated in every aspect of, you know, when we talk about entrepreneurship or innovation, you know, because people are entrepreneurial in this country. Yes, on the, you know, a long-term trajectory that has been on the downs, you know, downward trend, but overall, I think it's it's one of the uh, uh, the best place to actually start a company. In US? Um, in the US, right. How about Africa? <laughs> Com compared, compared to Africa, I will, I mean, right now, as I said, from 2000 to 2016, that the, the trend was slower. But right now, we're seeing an emerging of a lot of African starting companies. You know, because and the reason why that is happening, uh, Dennis, in Af you know the kind of government we have in in Africa. There's youth people are graduating country. I mean, graduating college and university every day, every year, and they can't find jobs. Right, mm. so. At the end of the day, I think the, the youth are, or people are realizing now that you can't depend on the government anymore to create a job for you. Guess what? I'm going to have to go out there and start a company and create my own job. Uganda, believe it or not, is one of the most entrepreneurial country in Africa, right? And they have one of some of the best, um, you know, uh, you know, engineer on, on, the, on, on the continent, right? Because they, they, they graduate these people, there's no job. So these people go out and start company and, you know, and, and you know, and, and start their own company. So that's, this is why since 2000, from 2019 up to now, we're seeing like as an exponential growth of, you know, company being launched by Africa on the continent, you know, because we realize that you can't just depend on the government anymore. You can't just graduate and tell yourself, I'm going to get a job in the government, that you have to know somebody. You have to know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody to get your job in the government. People don't want to do that anymore. 
so if you can start a company uh, that will sustain you, I think that's what most people are doing. So before then, that wasn't on the trend, but now it, there's a, a huge trend that is happening in Africa. That's probably what's contributing to what, what we're hearing that, you know, Africa is now headed in a way of China of the 2000s. You know, just how, you know, the Chinese people, uh, China was growing, you know, the middle class, how it was able to grow its middle class. Africa is headed into that direction right now. And we're hearing a lot of talks about it, especially the free trade agreement will actually contribute a lot to that. You know? So that's exactly the, the kind of trend we're seeing on the continent. Hmm. And yeah. do we have any report on what has been the relationship between African governments and these venture capitalists? Actually, directly, no. The, I think the only report that we have is that some countries, I think I, I mentioned that earlier, some countries are actually, they're looking at, you know, establishing venture capital rules or regulation now. Because just like the, the hedge funds here in the United States, the government didn't know anything about hedge fund up until lately before they started creating rules around it because they didn't understand what, 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 what hedge fund even is, right? So you have to create a sector. You can't just wait for the government to create regulation. You create you create a sector and then you wait for you you, you allow the government to, to come and, and, and regulate it later. That's if they catch on to it, right? So most countries in on, on the continent right now, they're creating regulation around venture capital, around private equity, how you want to regulate it, right? And the more countries begin to have set regulations around those, uh, you know, funding, uh, how to regulate it, you will see more investment pour onto the continent from the West or pe more people feel comfortable, of, you know, even wealthy people on the continent starting venture capital firm and private equity company to, to grow and, and invest in those countries. I mean, in those companies that are being started on the continent. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, Dennis, and to our listeners, I, I also have seen this uh, when uh, Obama had launched the thing about Power Africa, Dennis, and there was a lot of upbeat, there was a lot of excitement. But the issue was we didn't have the regulatory framework through which uh, electricity needs to function. Mm -hmm. and by that, I simply mean that we didn't have a regulatory body that would set the um, tariffs. Yeah. So although they were anxious to get in there, they had to pump their uh, brakes. And uh, right now, um, we've seen in the past two, three years where there's been more of a focus on the regulatory part. For example, in Liberia, we've we now recently have the um, the uh, Liberian regulatory branch of the electricity that helps set the uh, tariffs. Mm -hmm. So, so so I can see that we 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 have to move forward fast though. Um, because you know we don't want to miss this um train. Now we have a, a caller, Dennis. Uh, I think it's time to right. kind of look for our caller. I had a right. We, Go ahead. We, we ha we're having uh, some technical issue with our phone lines. Can unmute them. Yeah. <laughs> so in the back room, can you try unmuting our our phone lines so that we can have our callers to call in? And uh, if uh, that's not possible. Okay. Oh, Mr. Moy, how you doing? No, the phone line is muted. Yeah, no Let's see. I think you can still hear us, Dennis. So, Mr. Moy, can you um, unmute yourself? If not, we will ask you to please, please hang up and just call right back. And when you call what? back, we're gonna bring you in. It's it's not the issue. Okay. Oh, okay. No, the, the issue is not it's not the conference line. Look look at the participant list. The phone line is not getting unmuted. That's the, that's what I'm telling you. But go ahead, Joe. Okay. Okay. What's that? Technology, maybe we need some venture capitalists to uh, exactly invest in what, this. What we're we gonna need. That's what I'm telling you. That's not. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying, look at the panelists. You cannot unmute it.
All right, while we, while we work on that, so um, Mr. Kato, what do you what do you tell Africans when it comes to this whole idea of uh, venture capitalists? What, what what do we do? What are the prospects of this thing really taking roots in, in Africa, uh, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa? Prospect in terms of deals flow or in terms of uh, you know getting capital into the uh, the uh, the companies. Um, both getting capital both. into those company and then being on the ground in West Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and operating and making money? I, I think that's, so I, I like to use this example. So there's a, a private equity company called KKR, right? Uh, there's a, there's a, it's an abbreviation. I forgot what the uh, stands for. There's actually three individuals that started it, right? It's one of the biggest private equity company. So their biggest investment was actually in, I think Ethiopia, right? They invested in I think one of the biggest floral company in Ethiopia, but that I think it was about two hundred million dollar investment, right? That money they were sitting on sitting in offices in Europe. Why they invested in a company that is in Africa, right? Uh, two three years in, you know, they pulled out of that investment and folded their hands and and left Africa, right? Their excuse was that there wasn't a lot of deal flow. So they have this war chest of capital that they wanted to get onto the continent, but they weren't getting a lot of deals flow. Now, you can look at that from a two- Hold on a second, Gabriel. Mr. Moore, are you on? We, we don't want to mute you, so we're going to bring the, the, the caller in, okay, Gabriel? We don't want to mute him. That's you. fine. No, that's fine. Just bring him in. Okay, Mr. Moore, Okay. Let's see. He's not muted. Can you speak up? Oh, he might have his phone muted while he's talking. So he yeah. might uh Yeah. All right. Let's let's go to our next caller with the 302 error code. You are live. Your name and where you calling from? Please announce yourself. Hello, Mr. Moy, or caller. Hello. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good. Ah. Your name and where are you calling from? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yes, so we, we can. Hear you now. Oh, okay. Yeah, my, my, my name is Larry. I'm calling from Texas. Um, quick question for your panelists. Okay. Go ahead. You're live. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So how do you deal with issues of asymmetric information and moral hazard, especially in a society where you don't have a lot of competent data? How do you judge the value of a company before investing in it? because that's one of the serious risks you will run into in any system where you're looking to work as a venture capitalist. So how do you deal with that whole issue of asymmetric information and moral hazard? That's, that is, that is a great question. And, um, you know, for, I think that's, I'm, I'm glad you actually asked that question. Um, for Africa, I think that's one of the biggest challenge, right? We don't have uh, the credit system, right. To, to assess individual or assess company. Um, I, I know I mentioned earlier that I, you know, I do underwriting. We have a, on the individual side, we have the individual credit, but we also have uh, the business credit side. We can look into your business credit as well to see how well your business, you know, uh, you know it has been, you know, managing credit. Uh, um, to deal with that aspect of it, I think it, it's, you have to do everything from a fundamental level, right? So. Again, it has to do with relationships. So if I'm going to invest, let's say in you, and I know that you've been running this company, I have a private equity company, and you know your company approached me to invest in it. I'm that's part of the due diligence part of it because I know there's no way for me to pull credit or you know to look into it. I would take my time to really build a relationship with you, study this company, 
really get to know you, get to even visit the firm a couple of times and get to know the people that are, you know, working for the firm, understand what, you know, uh, the morale of the people that are working for you, that just your relationship, whether you have, um, you know, uh, you know, how well, you know, the type of customer you actually have, you know, so it would take that fundamental pieces of, you know, I know it's kind of archaic, but that's those are kind of basic mm -hmm. fundamental things that you have to look at. And okay. avoid of the credit piece because we don't have that aspect of it to to um you know, right. to into. Let's let's bring in our next caller. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. On the subject of, it's a pretty interesting uh, subject as uh, as usual, Mister uh, Ja. But uh, to uh, for your guest on the subject of, of credit, uh, most investors, especially the larger ones going into Africa, uh, they look towards uh, the credit rating agencies like uh, Standards and Poor's and Moody's, and those uh, agencies uh, via the rating they will determine you know the risk profile of those. Uh, those countries. And it's not only in Africa, they do it globally. Because they look at, say, for instance, the legal system, uh, the respect for contract rights. So if, if an investor right. has some sort of situation where there's animal, uh, some animus between investor and, say, his Liberian partner, will he, will he be given a fair shake uh, in the courts of Liberia? So those are the sort of things. And lately, they've been looking at for instance, stability of, elect of electricity, uh, access, you know, road access and all that. And most African countries, uh, I hate to say, say it, uh, are in the junk status. <coughs> because this rating starts from A, you know, double A, A, double A, uh, a triple A, B right. ratings and all that. Right. And all that. Um, hmm. Another aspect for investing in Liberia, and it seems like most Liberians are not taking advantage of it, especially those within the diaspora. There are a few that have taken advantage. And I was looking at uh, the listing of investments in Liberia, say from uh, the IFC and from OPIC. I'm sure your guest uh, knows, you know, these two organizations. Yeah. OPIC is the uh, Overseas Investment Corporation uh, from the United States. In fact, recently they gave someone in Liberia, I think, $24 million uh, uh, investment. And if you look at the profile they, into transportation, they gave another Liberian $5 million a year, $3 million a year. Go on their website and just, you know, click on Liberia and you see all the investments there. Right. And those are, you know, entrepreneurship, those are some of the uh, uh, resources they need to tap into, you know, like your uh, guest said. You know, you got you write a great business plan. Show, give them the route to profit uh, profitability, and you know, and if it makes sense, they invest. Another one is the International Finance Corporation of. I see. Uh, of, I think it's 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 an arm of the World Bank, right? The IFC. Yes. Yeah. They've done a lot of investment in Liberia, because I was even reading the last time this guy he got his little water uh, company. And they invested in it. They invested in it because they saw the need for it. And they're looking at, um, they, they, they take it from an entrepreneurial level. They're trying to solve problems in these, you know, uh, uh, developing a frontier nation. So you got a good business plan. They like it. They invest. And these investments, they go anywhere from 100 to way in the millions. Like I mentioned, the guy, uh, who, uh, set, uh, who I think was 25 million or 24 million uh, to, to that effect. But good subject, really enjoying it. Sometimes we have opportunities in Liberia and we just don't know how to convert those opportunities to our, our advantage. Like for instance, we all heard about the cable program, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they undersea cable uh, during early time. They landed yeah. in Liberia, I don't know, maybe six, seven years. The whole idea was to help entrepreneurs take advantage of it, uh, you know, uh, commercialize it. That hasn't been done. Uh, use it in areas like telemedicine and all that. That hasn't been done. So that's where we are. 
Thank you, Good Joe. Topic, though. Great, Thank you. great. All right. Thank you. Bye. Mr. Kara, respond to that question and then we'll be we'll be uh, kind of closing down the curtains. No, I, I think the uh, the caller actually highlighted some very key information. Um, he's right. And I think it, it answers some of your question why, one of your questions as to why we're not, you know, if you look at Liberia, I think you mentioned Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, why those countries aren't getting, you know, as much investment as the rest of the other countries. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the things you mentioned was the, the credit rating. He's absolutely right. That's why, you know, most investment company or even individual that are looking to invest in Africa actually use to, to assess the, the, the risk of the country. You know, if I'm going to your, your country to invest and I look at the credit rating uh, from Moody's or Standard & Poor and is in a junk status, that's, that's a red flag, right? That's, that, that tells me, it tells me a lot about your country without even getting to ask anybody in our country. Right now, to to expand on that, I think I, I think you guys heard that the uh, the government was trying to raise some bonds, right? Yeah. For Liberian to invest in it, right? That's the reason why the you know they couldn't do that because we don't even have a credit rating. If you don't have a credit rating, you can't raise bonds on the world market for anybody. You will rate you will you will draft it and post it out there, but nobody will buy it. It will be just Liberian, right? And even Liberian said will get squeamish about investing in a country that who that doesn't have a credit rating. Because you know that anytime that country can de default on that on that um you know on 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 their on their debt, you know. So he's absolutely right about that. Thank you. William, anything else then we can uh, ask Mr. Carter to uh, give his closing comments. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, I always like to look at the glass half full. And uh, when we talk about venture capitalists um, in Africa, uh, of course, uh, the dynamics in Africa are definitely unique and they're different. And one, I would say one kind of venture that looks, that appears to work quite well is the uh, SUSU. I'm not talking about the new SUSU that just came out in the past month or two months. I'm talking about the traditional uh, uh, SUSU, and uh, that has been quite effective in Liberia. Uh, we talk about micro-lending. Micro-lending has been quite effective in Liberia. Uh, OPEC is a very interesting organization, right? Um, as you go to work with OPEC and you dig through all the way, you really, what you see is OPEC is really just like another bank. Mm -hmm. That um, they want you to have some kind of skin in the game. So whether that may be a 10%, bring 10%, 20% down or something, we're going to fund the rest, but bring X percentage down. Mm -hmm. and so you have to understand how many companies really have that 10, 20% down. So venture capitalists, that's the space that sometimes they look to come in at. It's where you have that gap between the um, institutional funding and the person with that great idea, but mm -hmm. doesn't have that initial seed capital, that 20%, right? And so that's the space that uh, we speak about. And that's the space where um, uh, venture capitalists can play a key role. But to be sure, and to be fair, we are definitely a bit restricted um, because um, the systems, the tools, everything that's set up for a venture capital guy to get money from his investors requires that he say certain things for the investor to give him money. And mm -hmm. he's bonded by those things that he said. So if he says he's going to only invest in a company with good ratings or, or a certain kind of credit score and so forth, you and it doesn't to. exist in, um, in um, Africa, then uh, his hands are uh, basically tied. Uh, but there's been some good progress. We see more money go in. And we've seen in this world of fintech and new age technology, it's kind of weird because we do see Silicon Valley uh, kind of investing and ignoring some of these traditional indi indicators. So we don't know where that goes, but we know that it's going to be challenging for um, Africans to get in that door. And we encourage them to definitely keep, keep trying and Silicon Valley to wrap up. 
Don't forget, folks, that uh, accessibility in the U.S. is very difficult. So even if you're an African, have a great, brilliant idea, your first stop is at the embassy, <laughs> at the American embassy. And, uh, you know, so even if you want to make it to San Francisco, you're going through quite a bit of challenges. So hopefully there will be something from the technology side that can work that out. But we want to thank all of our listeners and viewers for joining us. And those are just my thoughts about the venture capital world. Back to you. If I, if I may add another thing to you, I think one of the most important uh, advantage of, you know, in, from a traditional bank, you know, and a, a private equity or venture capital. With traditional bank, we give you the money, right? And we tell you, pay me back such and such amount every month for such and such period. With the venture capital, you know, or private equity, we know that we, you have, we have equity in your company. So we're not just gonna give you the money and say, hey, pay me back at such and such, you know, amount over such and such period or duration, right? We're gonna practically take you by the hand and walk you through your growth process, right? So if I'm investing in your company, I'm making sure that somebody in our firm sits on your board, right? Because I want to make sure to know exactly everything that you're doing in our company to make sure that you're not just taking the money and going to, you know, bars or hanging out to the wrong places, right? So that's the different venture capital and private equity to literally hold you by your hand to help you grow, you know. Uh, and in most of most part of Africa, we have what we call the patient capital model, right? In the West, you know, they, you have advisors you can go to, you can call out, direct you. But in the West, you practically, as I said, you have to hold them by the hand because in addition to you giving them the money, you have to teach them about, you know, growth strategies, you know, the comp competitive strategies and all of those things. Because you're not just giving these people your money now. You have equity in that company. So you have to make sure that it succeeds because if it doesn't succeed, that impacts the level of your fund, your fail rate. And if you're failing, you're having more investing in most companies that are failing. You cannot, if you're going back to raise a second fund, you you won't you won't be as successful raising your second fund if you if your second, your first fund isn't as successful um, as you, you thought it, it would have been. You know? So I think that's one of the biggest. Uh, advantage of private equity from a traditional bank. Um, as far as the, uh, you know, the country, the continent as a whole, uh, private equity as a whole, I think the trend that is happening right now is going to continue. We're going to see lots of lots of investment on the continent. There's a lot of private equity companies that are starting up. Um, as I don't want to, you know, get on that <laughs> or that that what, what you call it that trend, but with this whole um, you know, black movement in this country, we're going to see a lot of capital going into Africa too. And people are now looking to invest in, in Africa as a whole or in black people as a whole. So you're going to see a lot of spread of that happening here too, but you're also going to see a lot of that, uh, trans, you know, transferring to investment in Africa as a whole. Um, so I think for me, I think that's practically, um, you know, my thought on the, um, you know, uh, on, on the subject. Oh, and that last piece, uh, uh, Gabriel, that's important because we were just talking about that last night, that uh, Ghana is taking advantage of that, unlike right. Liberia, you know, to be able to attract these uh, Black American funds mm -hmm. in our country. You know, Liberia is, is missing and somebody is eating our lunch. Yeah, and, and to, to, to not prolong this thing, I, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> you are absolutely right because, and I think we could have capitalized on this because of the history we have. Um, you know, we could have capitalized on it. And you're right. You know, again, this is a mindset thing. This is a, you know, being able to see opportunity and put yourself right in the path of it to capitalize on it. And, you know, we're not doing that. And somebody else is doing that. And that's something I think that could have, um, you know, help us get to a level or maybe get a little bit of assignment or some trend going to, to say, hey, maybe things are going to turn from, you know, uh, at, at the beginning of this decade or maybe in mid, mid you know, in the middle of the decade. But, you know, as you said, we missed that train. So it, it's yeah. taking off. Yeah. Opportunity to say is like a bald headed man. Right. You only passes your way once in your lifetime. You're not supposed to be talking about bald headed people. <laughs> no, you're <is> not bald. <laughs> 
Hey, that, that's, 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 that's man-made. All right. <laughs> All right, guys. I think uh, there's one All right, William, so we can draw down the curtains. I see uh, our man as soon as he's here. Uh, venture up. capital. Asuni, the way I understood venture capital is because you are trying to venture in a new territory, because these guys are starting up companies, so it's, it's really risky. So yeah. you are trying to venture in that risky territory. Is that why they call it venture capital? Possible. <laughs> uh, oh, you're asking that to Anthony? Yeah. Asuni, oh, Dennis, he, you, you he, want me to answer? Oh, uh, financial question when I don't know anything about finance. <laughs> I will only rely on the word venture. And and I think that's what the idea is that you know they're putting the money into territories maybe that are unusual, even if they are a usual, I mean usual territories. Uh the fact that maybe the company they are trying to do business with, they have not done business with that person before. And so mm. they are venturing into these territories. Uh, taking high risk uh, so that they can make profit at the end of the day. So I think the word venture uh, explains, you know, uh, how the investment is being done, and that's why they call it uh, venture capital. Venture I mean, that's capital. all I can think of, you know, that's, with that's, knowledge of finance. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. <laughs> that's brilliant. I like that idea. Focus on Liberia. Right. Where we can, where we can take and assuming who's in the back back room, who's on politics. Now he's talking venture capitalism. Yeah. yeah. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you, um, Mr. Carter, for, for the time. And uh, our host, William, thank you so much. And we want to thank all our viewers for joining us for this very, very important segment on venture capitalists in Africa. Thank our viewers, those who make comments and those who call in. William? Uh, in my closing, um, I want to say that in this in this world of venture capitalists and the things that we talk about, that uh, we often make mistakes and uh, you just have to find the person that is gracious enough to say, okay, you made a mistake um, and I'm willing to take a second chance. Mm -hmm. I say that because uh, there's a big, huge company called SoftBank. And let me tell you for the past uh, year, a year and a half, they have lost a lot of money in the billions. I think eight billion, right? And uh, but they're still going strong, and people still see them as uh, a knowledgeable, uh, as a knowledge knowledgeable venture capitalist firm in mm -hmm. the business. So they continue to raise capital. So I I just leave mm -hmm. that with everyone that's out there trying to get into this thing that do not do not give up. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. All right. So, guys, uh, on that note, I want to say we have come to the end of this broadcast. This evening at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, we have a political show coming on. Mm. Uh, Elizana Cummings of the ANC made a major speech to the nation, and we are going to be analyzing that speech at 6 p.m., I mean, 7 p.m., right here on Focus on Liberia. We have two gentlemen. Mm -hmm. One said, two gentlemen, one said, hey, the speech is excellent. The other one said, hey, the speech is disappointing. And so they will be analyzing based on their description of the uh, the speech. speech. And we from Focus on Liberia will be asking them the tough question so that our viewers and the audience can know whether or not the speech that we're giving by Cummings is actually disappointing Oh, very excellent. So don't mm. miss it this evening, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, live right here on Focus on Liberia. I will be here with my analytical eye. Dennis will be here. The way around that guy will be here. William will be in the back room trying to handle business. Don't yeah, I'll miss be it. Here. Ball. Will you give anybody some bitter ball? <laughs> <laughs> of course, I will give some bitter balls. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, Gabriel, we can't thank you enough, folks in cyberspace. We can't thank, thank you, you enough. guys. This is how we will come to the end of this broadcast. The sun said we are all Liberians. And don't forget, that sun is also telling you, if you are all Liberians, Corona is also around. Be safe, guys. Bye-bye. We are all Liberians. Liberia is our Liberian people. Yeah, you made the
Bye.